Check Podcasts. Hi, I'm Bruce Williams. I'm the CEO of the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce. This is Chamber Chats, being recorded as always in the podcasting studios of Czech Television, one of our Chamber Champions. I will acknowledge to begin with, as always, that I live and work on the unceded ancestral territory of the Lekwungen-speaking nations, known as the Songhees and the Esquimalt. And Chamber Chats is made possible by the support of Island Savings, a division of First West Credit Union and C-SPAN Victoria Shipyards. We have been watching as the post-secondaries in our community have tried to pivot themselves back into something of what they looked like back in 2019 and 2020 pre-pandemic. The process is ongoing, but it's making great great gains right now, rather. We're going to catch up right now on what's going on with Royal Roads University with the President and Vice Chancellor, Dr. Philip Steenkamp. Welcome back to Chamber Chats. Nice to see you. Thanks, Bruce, and it's a pleasure to be here. So, yeah, the pandemic, you know, to understate, it was disruptive for everybody. Post-secondary is no exception. So where is Royal Roads at right now in establishing kind of back into a routine of operations? Yeah, well, thanks for that. And I'm joining you from the campus today on the lands of the Kasapsen and Lekwungen ancestors and families as well. Uh, In terms of sort of where we are back, you know, in many ways, uh, Royal Roads was really well equipped uh, because, you know, we've had years and years of experience in online and, and blended learning. Um, however, you know, it did affect us as well. We had to move some of our, our on-campus in-person programming online. And we also, of course, saw many staff, you know, working from home as m- many other businesses did too. I would say we were um, among the earlier organizations to return to work on campus and also to return to the classroom. So we are pretty much where we were prior to the pandemic in terms of the the balance of what activity is is on campus and what is online, uh, with a few modifications, of course. So as with any business or operation, there are things that have changed forever. There are things that will stay that way. There's things that will return to the way they were before. Have there been any significant or profound changes that you made because of the pandemic that you're going to stick with? Yeah. And, you know, I I think it's really important to understand the lessons of the pandemic and adopt sort of good practices moving forward. So a couple of things. I mean, we've learned to conduct business in a hybrid way, which is fantastic, you know, partly in person, partly online. I mean, our board meetings now, we have returned to in-person board meetings, but if board members are not, a- not able, say, to travel to Victoria for the meeting, we they can join us virtually, and that wasn't something we typically did before. You know, sometimes people will join you through a teleconference and stuff like that, but it wasn't quite the same. Uh, so I think that's been a good practice. Uh, we are traveling less because we are attending conferences and things like that more virtually than we had previously. So that's efficient because uh, it takes less time, but it's also an important part of our climate action plan, of course, because it reduces your carbon footprint uh, generally. And then uh, more generally, we are looking at uh, uh, a new framework for flexible work arrangements as well. So I think we've all come to appreciate uh, the importance of flexibility in work arrangements, although I, for one, am somebody who believes strongly in the value of people gathering together in person and returning to the office. But there's clearly a balance here, and I think we're open to looking at more flexible arrangements than we were pre-pandemic. Uh, even pre-pandemic, uh, Royal Roads did have a certain amount of virtual engagement because it's people from around the world that are studying there. So was your transition into that virtual model, you think, a little more seamless than maybe others were facing? It was a lot easier, for sure. Seemed like a lot of work to us, but you know, talking to colleagues across the country, I think we had it easy. Um, you know, as I said, we've had this experience in, in online learning for over 25 years now. And what I saw happen in many other places wasn't true online learning. It, in fact, was what I would call um, emergency remote learning. You know, mm-hmm. essentially, you saw instances where people were basically videotaping their lectures and putting them online. And, uh, you know, that, that's not true online learning. Um, so we we had a lot of experience in this area, so we were able to adapt, I think, much more quickly. The one big challenge we had is, you know, part of the richness of the experiences here, you do a lot of your work online, but then you come for these intensive two, three week on campus residencies. And the cohorts really bond in those residencies and they work all through the day. We had to put those online, um, putting an intensive full day 
two week residency online was a challenge for us. But the good news is we figured out how to do it and how to make it work. So we've got that as a tool available to us moving forward in case there are other disruptions. But yeah, like you say, to, to put a lecture online, for example, just to record it and post it, you don't have the chance for the interaction. You don't get to ask questions. You don't get to get into debates and challenge and all that stuff. So that, that's a really important part of learning, isn't it? Yeah, it's a critical part of learning and it's key to the, uh, to the pedagogy here. You know, we have small cohorts. They work together interactively. They learn as much from their instructors as they learn from each other. Um, and it's just a very, very different way of, of teaching, of teaching and learning. A lot of the content, um, you know, that is required in the courses, the students get ahead of time. You know, they'll get that online. They'll read the material, and so the actual engagement time is all about the discussion. It's about the debate. It's about the challenge, and that's the richness of it. Now, you know, at other universities, large, large universities where you have hundreds of students in a class, that kind of pedagogy is not available to you. So we figured ourselves actually really lucky that we've had this experience and, uh, you know, we could build on it. One of the things about post-secondaries that enriches our communities in general is the element of international students. They bring... They bring their culture from other parts of the world that enriches our living experience. They get their learning experience here. Um, and international students, obviously, were not traveling and not showing up during the pandemic. But another part of that, international students are a very significant part of your funding model. Tell me about the impact that that's had. Yeah. So, you know, the, the pandemic clearly interrupted the flow of international students. And we adapted. We put a lot of programs online because a lot of our international students are obviously here for in-person programming, put a lot of programming online and, um, you know, the numbers went down and we took a bit of a hit, but the key challenge this fall has been the delays in visa processing. Um, you know, federal government offices around the world have either been closed or short staffed. There's a huge backlog. Um, the federal department responsible for immigration has been dealing with, uh, of course, the challenges of Afghanistan and Ukraine. Uh, and then on top of that, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of backlogged uh, visas. So that's been the key issue for us. It's hit most universities and colleges across the country. This fall, students were just not able to get here, even though we had admitted them. Um, I've been working really closely. I'm now the chair of the International Committee of Universities Canada, representing the 98 universities across the country. And I've been working closely with the federal officials, including a meeting with the new federal deputy minister of immigration um, a few weeks back to try and get this sorted out. And I'm encouraged by the steps the federal government is taking. They've hired 1,250 new people. Uh, they're looking at a new uh, IT platform. Um, and uh, they're doing what they can. However, we still have this amazing backlog. And as you said, this has become a fundamental part of the funding model at most universities and colleges across the country. In an era in which we've seen flat funding and inflation, we've used uh, revenue from international students to close that gap. I mean, that's not the reason we have international students. It's for the reasons you mentioned. It's part of the richness and the, and, the, and the diversity and the kind of global citizenship that we committed to. But nevertheless, they have become an important part of our funding model. Um, so we've taken a hit. Many institutions have taken a hit. And uh, I know some will post deficits this year. I think we are going to balance, but uh, literally just balance on, on the head of a pen uh, <laughs> this year. I'm hopeful that by the spring, we will see um, that the the backlogs have mostly been cleared and that students who want to get here can get here. Yeah, we're hearing concerns from all sectors about the amount of time it takes to process immigrants coming into the country, students or otherwise. Uh, the, you know, the government federally has made this very robust promise that they're going to bring in 450,000 new Canadians mm -hmm. every year when we're told that the backlog right now in total is about 2 million that have to be processed along with that. So as you say, that needs to be dealt with. Anyway, we're going to talk next about a brand new campus for Royal Roads University. We'll do that next. Our guest on Chamber Chats today is Dr. Philip Steenkamp. He is the president and vice chancellor of Royal Roads University. So you're moving into a new campus in the West Shore. Let's talk about that. It's in Langford, right? Tell me about that. Yeah, it's in Langford. Uh, this is a, a great, uh, a great new initiative. 
So Royal Road's purchased about four acres of land right smack downtown Langford, where the where the Catholic Church used to be. And uh, we worked with uh, colleagues from Camosun and UVic to develop a business case to submit to government to request government funding for the first phase of that new campus. And the government in August approved that funding, uh, providing $77 million for a new building. City of Langford, too, really came to the table in a big way, providing funding for infrastructure and parking, you know, upwards of, of $30 million in value there. Um, and so this will be a brand new campus, downtown Langford. Um, it will involve, uh, obviously, Raw Roads owns the land and will own the building, but we've invited UVic and Camosun in as equal partners to offer programming as well. And more recently, we invited the Justice Institute of BC and, and we added a floor to the building uh, to accommodate uh, their programming too. So Royal Roads currently is a graduate school. You don't do undergrad stuff. Will you now be offering that in conjunction with the others at that Langford campus? Yeah, so we do we do undergrad here, but what we do is we call undergraduate completion here. So if you want to do your third and fourth year undergrad, you can come here. Some students do two years somewhere else and they come here and finish. Uh, and we do offer undergrad for international students, year one and two, but it's a very small and focused program. So for the first time, at this new campus, we will be offering all four years of undergraduate education for all students. And it's really focused on the students of the West Shore. Um, and, you know, the, the whole sort of rationale behind this campus um, was to address the low participation rates in post-secondary education on the West Shore and to provide post-secondary uh, access and options for West Shore families and students. So you're taking the school to the people instead of the people coming to the school. That's pretty smart. You put it right in front of them and there it is. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, proximity is a key factor in terms of access. All the literature shows you that if, if you build it closer to home, people will come. So what, what specific curriculum will be offered at that campus? So Royal Roads is offering a brand new undergraduate curriculum. Um, it, it will be, uh, if not unique, certainly very distinctive in Canada. And there's a lot of excitement about it because the entire curriculum is what we call challenge or problem based. So the programming will be uh, organized around particular challenges, say a challenge like climate change or poverty um, or a particular problem, like a problem a local business might have. So there'll be a succession of these challenges and problems uh, through the first two years uh, of a student study with us. We'll customize and curate programming around this. This will be in small cohort groups uh, as well. So it will be learning by doing. So very practical and applied kind of undergraduate education. And then in third and fourth year, they'll have the options to stream into one of our existing undergrad programs. We've got six to eight of those programs lined up. Or alternatively, you know, they might want to go into UVic or go somewhere else. Uh, but four years will be available on this campus uh, for undergrad students. UVic's going to offer some um, uh, some pre-engineering, uh, some computer science, uh, university transfer programs. Camosun's going to offer a whole array of things, um, high school completion programming, uh, early childhood education, some pre-health stuff uh, as well. And then the Justice Institute's going to offer um, uh, stuff in paramedicine and emergency responder training too. So, you know, that that's a very short summary of, of what will be there. Uh, in addition, we'll have all kinds of programming for adult learners. Uh, School District 62 will be, uh, will be in the building as well. So they'll be offering programming uh, that they offer for things like high school completion and other programming. Um, and we'll have an innovation center in there too where we will, we will work with local businesses and local community organizations uh, on particular issues, challenges, problems, opportunities that they have. And it's really important too, of course, that the graduates are aligning with the needs in the workforce. So you do work like that, right? To sort of audit that process to make sure that the jobs that are needed are being trained. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, right from the get-go, you know, in our legislation for establishing Royal Roads University, our legislation specifically says you will offer programming in applied and professional areas exclusively. 
and you will offer programming that responds to the demands of the labor market. So that's been part of our DNA from the beginning. That will continue at this new campus uh, as well. We work really closely with uh, business industry and community groups to give us advice on our programming. We have advisory councils, I think seven of them right now, who provide us with advice in particular sectors. Um, and we will continue uh, with that because, uh, you know, for our students, many of our students are coming to Raw Roads to upskill or reskill. Um, and with the expectation that what they learn here and what they get here will equip them well for a job and a job that will exist. Now, having said that, many of us don't know. I mean, none of us know what some of the jobs of the future are going to be either. Um, so we are also giving students the kind of skill sets they need to thrive in a rapidly changing economy too. You know, critical things we hear from industry are, we want people with critical thinking skills. We want people with problem solving skills. We want people who know how to collaborate. We want people with good communication skills. So all of that is part of all of our programming as well, as well as having some of the really specific technical skills as well. And at the Chamber, we have recently very, been very proud to announce that we're creating uh, something called the 1863 Fund yeah. because our Chamber turns 160 years old in 2023. So we're putting up a $160,000 pledge that will help students study through the bursaries and assistance programs that we will provide through the foundation at both Royal Roads, UVic, and also at Camosun. So we're very proud of that. So thank you for working with us on that. Uh, we're going to take another quick look at what's going on at the beautiful campus at Royal Roads next. Our guest today on Chamber Chats is Dr. Philip Steenkamp. He is the President and Vice Chancellor of Royal Roads University. You know, we're talking about skills needs and stuff. What about yours? What kind of shape are you in with, with faculty and staff? Do you have enough people right now? In other words, are you hiring? Um, well, because we've got budget challenges, because of, uh, you know, the fact I mentioned international students can't get here, um, we are still hiring, but we, we are not hiring at the rate I would like to be hiring. Mm. Um, now, you know, I'm, I'm assuming things are going to turn around in the new year and we'll be able to get back to where we were. Like many organizations, I think we've seen more turnover than you would normally see. You know, this is a, a, an impact post-pandemic, I think many organizations are seeing. But we also are still seeing a lot of interest in coming here, too. So the last few competitions I know that I've been aware of for positions here, we've had very, very good candidates to choose from. I know that that has not necessarily been the case across the country. I've been talking to colleagues who say, you know, they're having problems filling positions. It's a lot of poaching going on and stuff like that. Um, but as you said, I mean, this is a beautiful place, uh, Bruce. So I think we are lucky. People want to come to Victoria. They want to come to Royal Roads. They want to work in a place like this. Um, and, you know, we will continue to promote uh, the value of working uh, in a place like Royal Roads University. You know, when you look at the uh, sort of ancestral stewardship of the land, uh, Indigenous peoples and First Nations have been here for millennia, long before we were here. And Royal Roads is a leader in trying to lead that reconciliation uh, effort, as we are at the Chamber. We're, we're increasing our cohort of, of Indigenous-owned businesses within the Chamber, for example. But tell me about some of the work you're doing at Royal Roads. It's quite remarkable. Yeah, thank you so much. And, you know, this is a key priority for us, is working uh, on issues concerning truth and reconciliation uh, generally, um, you know, implementing the appropriate recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, also looking at uh, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and how we implement that in our context uh, too. I think the thing I'm probably proudest of is the way in which we've really worked on indigenizing our curriculum over the last couple of years. We've hired a number of indigenous staff working uh, in the in the education area uh, generally to assist faculty in indigenizing curriculum, incorporating indigenous ways of knowing and being uh, into our curriculum across many, many, many programs. Uh, and more specifically, in the last while, we've established something called an emerging emerging indigenous scholars circle. We've hired Dr. Shawnee Pete who used to be at the University of Victoria to head this up. So she's come in. And the idea here is to, to hire and support um, emerging, young and emerging indigenous scholars 
uh, as they establish their careers. You know, so people who've just finished PhDs or doing postdocs, and they want to come here and get the experience they need in terms of teaching and research. And I know some of them will go on to other places, and that's just fine. Uh, and we hope that some of them will stay here too and become indigenous faculty. So there's a lot of work going on in this space. Lots of other things happening too. Of course, our engagement with indigenous commun local communities continues. We have one of the biggest uh, national indigenous people's days events on this campus with our canoe protocols and thousands of people on campus uh, at that time. We continue to engage with the Blue Heron group, which is our group of elders and old ones who advise us on everything we uh, we do here at, at the university. Um, and you know, there are many, many uh, other initiatives uh, in this space as well. We have two indigenous board members who provide us with invaluable uh, advice and guidance as well. Just gonna wrap it up here though. And when we again talk about this magnificent property, the castle and beyond at Royal Roads, uh, there's some other transformative things happening with the buildings and some of the uh, the plots on land too. So tell me about that. Yeah, there's some great stuff happening on the existing uh, Colwood campus here at at Hatley Hatley Park. Um, so we've just opened this brand new auditorium, the Dogwood Auditorium, uh, which used to be the old swimming pool. People will remember the old swimming pool and squash courts. Now, beautiful 400 seat auditorium. We held our convocations there. Uh, this year, for the first time in, in 15 years, we were back on campus for convocation. So that was incredible. Um, we are also doing uh, some major work on uh, the Japanese garden. We've hired a, a Japanese garden designer originally from Kyoto who's provided us with a plan for a complete renovation of that garden. I want to make it one of the finest uh, Japanese gardens in North America. And then uh, something we're very, very proud of, we've started... Uh, food production at scale on campus again. So we've laid out uh, garden beds in the old uh, kitchen garden, and we produced over a thousand pounds of fresh fruit for community organizations and food bank this year. We're gonna expand that significantly next year. Uh, the, the next phase of that development is an indigenous uh, garden where we will grow uh, indigenous foods and medicines uh, as well. And then we are also expanding our orchard and we're going to have a poly orchard, so many different kinds of fruit trees and be growing fruit for our own uh, university uh, uh, community uh, as well. Dr. Philip Steenkamp, President and Vice Chancellor at Royal Roads, thanks for your time today. Thanks so much, Bruce. It's been a pleasure. You bet. And I'm Bruce Williams. We'll see you again soon for another Chamber Chat. Mm -hmm.